introducing um, John Bird, uh, who's Professor of Art and Critical Theory at Middlesex University. Um, he's the author of many books, um, including a book on, uh, he's co-author of a book on Nazi Sparrow written in 1996, and author of Other Worlds, The Art of Nazi Sparrow and Kiki Smith in 2003, and of Leon Golob, Echoes of the Real um, in 2010, which was revised, updated in... Well, it was in 2000 and then revised up later. 2010. Um, and he's curated two Leon Golov uh, retrospective exhibitions. The first at the Irish Museum of Modern Art, Dublin, touring to South London Gallery and Albright Knox Art Gallery, Buffalo in 2000, 2001. And then at the Reina Sophia in Madrid in 2011. And he curated a solo exhibition of Nancy Sparrow at the ICA in London in 1987. And he's going to um, talk now about myth and figure in the work of Leon Golob and that's his theory. Thanks. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I'm going to start off by showing about six or seven minutes of uh, a film that was made by the American artist Charlie Ahern of Leon Golob. Uh, it was started filming in 2000, up to 2003. It's partly because some of you may not know their work too well, but although the film's about Leon, it actually has quite, the bit I'm gonna show is both of them in their studio in New York when they were there, and there's a kind of very nice interchange between them, and it also shows some of their works, and also gives you a clue, partly into the relationship between them, but also in their respective working methods in the studio. So I thought it would be useful to set the scene, if you like with that. Um, the talk that I've got, as I explained, I'm very old tech, it's going to be a paper which I'm going to read. Uh, I'll probably extemporise a lot of bits as we go along. Um, and it has a subtitle, which is, it's turtles all the way down. That will become clear when you see the little bit of the video. So. Hip, 
which says that once upon a time she was a pretty lively young lioness. See? This is a stamp I had made, and I had it made one in German and one in English, and it says guaranteed collection friendly. That's to let collectors know that I'm a friendly guy. So <laughs> I always tease and I said, well, my son is there in the kitchen, naturally. And uh, so that's the way it is, and I, I do believe it's the price we have. But we've divided it so that the workspace is, and it's roughly for the IRS, it's kind of like 80% studio space. We moved in in 77. So um, that's the way it is, and, and it's Fixed up as, as it's quite evident, as minimally as possible. You know, it's nothing too uh, too fancy. And and uh, also our bedrooms. I think you've seen them. Are tiny. They're like uh, man's is like a month cell, and mine's like it was like a college dorm. But it's not like a ship's uh, cell into a class. But <laughs> very untidy, I'm gonna say. And uh, we just try to keep it, you know, we jealously guard our working space here. And I was loath really to even give this much space up for our living quarters where you have to. You gotta live. <laughs> and people are always trying to tell us to get a, that I should get a, a, you know, an easy chair. And we should get this, we should get that, you know, and where we would put it. <laughs> So that's why it's called its turtles all the way down. 
Over the years spent researching, writing, and curating the art of Leon Golub and Nancy Spiro, something of an obsession stretching back to the early 1980s, I've increasingly come to recognize the limitations of any account of one artist that does not also include the work of the other. Of course, this was something of which both artists were well aware. Sharing a living studio apartment in New York for the late 1970s, they were each other's first viewer and critical voice. A dialogical relationship that accepted both the difference and specificity of each other's practice, but also recognised the deep affinities in the themes and subjects that engaged them. Thus, in a recorded interview with Katie Klein and Helene Posner, for the exhibition of both artists they curated for the American Centre in Paris in 1995, Spiro reflected that, quote, perhaps this is the first occasion where either of us has confessed that we are inside each other's work, inside each other's head. And given their peculiar nocturnal studio hours, in fact, nine C titled a work, The Hours of the Night, these conversations flowed freely, uninterrupted by the often frenetic activity of everyday life, with assistants, visitors, guests and family a constant presence and distraction. I should explain that when they went to live in Paris, they were in Paris from 1959 to 1964, they went to Paris with two young children. Um, and Nancy had a third child, was born in Paris. And uh, as, as a mother, she found it impossible, of course, to find time to work. So she started working at night. The kids would kind of, you know, do their things during the day. She put them to bed and she started working. And Leon, to keep her company, also started working at night. And when I first met them, which was in the sort of early 1980s, in their studio in New York, that's what they were doing. That was their pattern. I mean, they did also work during the day, but basically the productive work happened um, from sort of midnight through to sort of six or seven in the morning. Other than that, they just take cat naps. In the broadest sense then, both artists address issues of traumatic history through the interaction between body and meaning between the symbolic and the semiotic. Nancy would joke that Leon has the guys and I have the girls. And it's true that sexuality and relations of power and vulnerability did break down along gender lines in their art. But that is to oversimplify the constructions of identity in their respective figurings of the body. Discussing the dangerous image in Proust's In Search of Lost Time, Julia Kristeva posed a question that could equally be addressed to both Golub and Spiro. What are the subjective benefits which accrue to the spectator or the artist in descending into hell and making visible in the image the most dramatic drives towards dissolution of identity? This is an article published in 1998. It's my contention that the work of these two artists, and of course we can think of other artists of the post-war period, that goes some way towards an answer. Through understanding the psychic attractions of the dystopian element of the society of the spectacle, the violent image, art might contend with and transform such imaginings. Thus, when the photographs of Abu Ghraib prison first appeared across the global media, it was Golub's depictions of torture and interrogation that immediately came to mind, a reminder that art can generate recuperative iterations of meaning. Likewise, in the late work by Nancy Spiro, Maypole Take No Prisoners, initially made for the 2007 Venice Biennale and composed of 200 treated and painted aluminium heads attached by chains to a central upright pole. We are given the possibility through art of a second birth. As Christopher argues, an encounter with the fragmented image touches parts of our personalities which are themselves already pulverized and dissolving. Leon Golub and Nancy Spiro met at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the immediate post-war period. Golub attended on the GI Bill in 1947, Spiro the same year, and both graduated in 1949, Golub staying on for a further year to receive his MFA award. They married in 1951 and shared a studio in Chicago throughout the 1950s. In 1959, they moved with two children to Paris returned to America in 1964 and relocated to New York, where they lived and worked 
eventually moving to their studio apartment just below Washington Square. Leon Gollum died in 2004, Nancy Spiro five years later in 2009. I think it's also worth saying that they, of course, being in New York at that time and Washington Square, were very, very close to the events of 9-11. In fact, I was actually in New York with them at the time. So they saw the planes go in, saw the towers come down, and to some extent their post-2001 work needs to be read within the context of that also dramatic historic moment. The roots of both Golov's and Spiro's figuration reside partly in the influences of the teachers and artists they encountered at the Art Institute, and in the social and cultural history of Chicago as the second city, a role which positioned New York as an object of both desire and distrust. Whereas New York's modernity was constructed partly from the influx of European artists and intellectuals during the interwar period, with an emphasis upon the visual arts, performance and cinema, Chicago attracted only two internationally recognized figures, Mies van der Rohe and Laszlo Mamolinage. Chicago's modernity was expressed in the field of design, with the responsibility for a visual modernist aesthetic parallel to architecture falling upon the Art Institute, which comprised a museum, schools of art and drama, a theatre and an exhibition space. This then provided the cultural context for both Spiro and Golub's developing visual languages, also formed through visits to the Field Museum of Natural History and exhibitions at the museum, in particular Jean de Buffet, a key figure for both artists. For de Buffet, who had several exhibitions in Chicago, and gave talks during the late 1940s and 1950s, Chicago's artistic tradition, particularly its receptiveness to surrealism, was a more conducive context for his anti-rational figuration, or La Brue. Golub was always deeply immersed in art's critical and theoretical discourses and art's social function, besides being active in the politics of the art world. An early essay critiquing abstract expressionism was published in the College Art Journal, and both artists shared an ethical and moral commitment to social justice as the referent of their individual forms of figuration. In Spiro's case, feminism and the plight of women. In Golub's, the brutal realities of state violence and oppression as an always unequal power relation. Leon Golub, and to a lesser extent Nancy Spiro, were part of the group of artists named by the critic Franz Schultz as the Monster Roster School. If the search for adequate visual depictions of modern subjectivity is the connecting link of the post-war American avant-garde, then it is the figure as presence, albeit veiled or fragmented in Chicago artists, that separated them from the negation of the figure in abstraction that characterizes the New York School. However, what Chicago and New York artists did share was a preoccupation with the function of myth as a generative impulse for individual and collective imagery, and, as has been argued in more recent accounts of the symbolic thematics of abstract expressionism, the shadow of the Holocaust. This appears in Golub's imaging of a tragic masculinity, and Spiro's inclusion of images of traumatized female victims, and for both artists, their Jewish identities becoming increasingly significant in later works. Besides their visits to the Field Museum, Spiro and Golub were receptive to classical art and antique examples of figure in the body. By the mid-1950s, Golub's imagery included late Hellenistic sculpture, pre-Columbian ceremonial masks, shamanism, outsider art, European modernism, particularly Picasso, de Buffet, and Beckman, and Northwest, Northwest Coast Native American art, all interests shared by Spiro with the addition of medieval art, bestiaries and apocalyptic visions, and Egyptian and Hittite iconographies. Their engagement with the literary and visual antecedents of classical antiquity were reinforced for a year spent in Italy in 1956, initially in Ischia, then Florence with trips to Pompeii, Herculaneum and Naples for Etruscan art. Both were drawn to a key mythic figure of the Western unconscious, the Sphinx, a hybrid formation combining the size of gender and human-animal tension. In Sophocles' account of the Sphinx in Oedipus Rex, posing the mystery of the human, 
we can see a thematic trope of vocal artists, explicit in Gollop, transformed in Spiro, of human relationships grounded in reciprocal acts of violence. Here myth retains its allegorical force as the expression of historical fictions that formalise a culture's fears and fantasies. This exhibition, The Nakeds, which includes works by Gollop and Spiro, um, the two Gollop ones are the two ones at the back wall at the top, the pink, the one in pink and the red drawing. The Nancy Spiro is the one on this is end wall, just around the wall, the little, one of the two figures, collage figures, and the other one is this extraordinary Sheila figure in that room just by the entrance to, to the library. <coughs> And this exhibition, Naked, which includes works by Gollum's view, presents images of the body exposed, seeing the representation of nakedness, how various artists from Sheila to the present company have explored themes of sexuality, selfhood, and alienation, which are deeply embedded in the Judeo Christian tradition. In 1959, a large scale international exhibition curated by Peter Seltz for the Museum of Modern Art New York, New Images of Man explored similar subject matter against the backdrop of hegemonic abstraction, taking the body as signifier of a new dignity, sometimes despair. Receiving extensive, mostly hostile, critical attention, in particular William Rubin attacked Golub's paintings, the couple decided to leave America for what they hoped would prove a more receptive cultural environment in Paris. For Spiro, this is something of a reunion. She studied for a year at the École des Beaux-Arts from 1949 to 1950. During their five years in the city, Gollop massively increased the scale of his images to that of the largest of French history paintings, influenced, of course, by many visits to the Louvre. And Spiro worked on what she termed the Black Paris paintings, themes of lovers, couples, and maternity. And in fact, the collage, the embracing figures, uh, derives from the paintings of this period. The move to Paris also represented a symbolic reversal of the flow of cultural capital from America to Europe, and a renewal of their engagement with classical themes. For Gola, his long-term interest in the art of Greece and Italy was for its role as a public representation of civic and historical values and as a form of battle art. However, what drew him to the antique was not the democratic ideal of Athenian society, but the struggles and uncertainties of the Hellenistic period and the totalitarian Roman state. Golub's series of paintings begun in Paris, the Gigantomaches, reference the high reliefs of the great altar of Zeus at Pergamon, battling giants whose overdeveloped musculature also suggested contemporary equivalents in the visual poses and stereotypes found in gay pornography. It was in fact with the Gigantomaches that the artist began to systematically use photographic imagery <coughs> for his own iconography of the body. In addition, both artists were drawn to the Dionysian expression of sexuality and the Cardinalesque as a means to visually interrogate the Western regime of the body. The classical archive's sensory appeal implicates it in bodily experience and, again common to Spiro and Gollop, in narrative. Spiro's lexicon of 500 female figures, which she referred to as her alphabet of hieroglyphs, includes a significant number drawn from antiquity, particularly goddesses, whilst Gollop constantly recycled classical references. Eros and Thanatos dominate the work of his final years. The way in which Nancy Spiro worked, you've got a little sense of that, of that shot of that trestle table covered with those images. She would find either herself or Golovin would, would find images or others would give her images, which were then either redrawn or photographed and then cut out. And the cut out <coughs> was then sent to a plate maker Initially, the plates that were made were metal zinc plates, and these were then printed, just inked up on one side, and printed onto surfaces, handmade paper, which had been covered in different kinds of colours and designs, directly onto it. And then at some later period, after she'd been working in this way for some years, it was pointed out to her that these plates could also be made in a flexible, flexible material, 
like, like, like rubber. Um, and that allowed her to actually extend her imagery to the surfaces of walls, both interior and exterior surfaces. <coughs> For both artists, it is the body as text that carries the trace of culture, memory and history. A construction that, through its modalities and materiality, attests to lived experience and social being. The body is symbolically and psychically invested, subject to the culture's founding and contemporary myths, the narratives of the sacred and profane body that invest lived experience with significance beyond our everyday engagement with the world of things. Bodies, whole or fragmented, from victimization to empowerment in Spiro, violated and trapped in unequal relations of power in Golub, are the semantic units in visual languages constructed from characters of mythology, literature, scripture, history, and the contemporary world. For Spiro, this becomes an expressive visual poetics of movement, gesture, color, and form. The embodied subject traveling a route from interiority to exteriority, damaged to liberated, abject to made whole, an expansive aesthetic most clearly evidenced in her installations Printed figures cavorting across interior and exterior walls, ceilings and floors. Golub is best known for his 1980s wall-sized depictions of mercenaries, torture and interrogation scenes. The body under duress. But constantly running through his work is the sense of history pressing upon the present and of the weight of cultural and political mythologies upon subject formation. The re-emergence of classical references in paintings of the, of the late 1990s and the recurrence of the figure of the Sphinx, a cloning of the hybrid and the cyborg, signal an ongoing narrative. The gods will have their revenge. If you threaten the established order, you must expect retribution. Three pa paintings from this period, Dionysiac, Prometheus 1 and 2, return the viewer to the Greco-Roman world in order to figure a myth of the origins of making that has deception and desire and gender at its centre. In Plato's account, Prometheus steals the gift of fire from Athena, an action that threatens the distinction between the gods and humankind, the ability to mould brute material into useful artefacts. And he experiences the fate of inhabiting a solitary, suffering body. Gollum's story of the body is of the figure entering into conflicted social relations as a historical agent, only in later works to become the prey of howling dogs, laughing lions, strutting skeletons, and ferocious raptors. The two drawings exhibited here are from his final years, when he was no longer physically able to regularly complete all size paintings. Experimenting with the old transfer method, using oil sticks and acrylic paint on vellum or board. He revisited earlier themes of violence, mythology, history, masculinity, with the inflection of a playful and irreverent eroticism. The Sphinx returns, partnered by centaurs and she-centaurs, and that ludic figure of the carnivalesque, the satire. For me, this again emphasizes the productive dialogue and exchange between both artists, that continued over five decades. Golub responded to the carnivalesque dimension present in Spiro's visuality. Just as his introduction of text into his paintings of the 1990s was a homage to her text image configurations. Julia Kristeva had described the structure of the carnivalesque discourse as the opposition of text, high and low, birth and agony, food and excrement, praise and curses, laughter and tears. A fertile discursive arena that describes their individual creative imaginations. For Spiro, this has its origins in her early attraction to the poetry and prose of Antonin Artaud, whose tortured language provided a surrogate voice through which she was able to represent her own angry sense of exile as a woman attempting to inhabit the strange and alienating male-dominated art world. Later she turned to foundational cultural myths, the archaic goddess, and all those transgressive figures from literature, history and mythology who subverted normative social narratives and traditions. Another key reference was the Egyptian Book of the Dead, 
Texan image papyrus scrolls from approximately 1500 BC. This illustrated guide to the underworld, a compilation of myth, magic and ritual, inspired Spiro's two 11 panel works, The Hours of the Night. The first version, completed in 1974, presents large areas of empty space punctuated by text and tiny hand-drawn images. The second in 2001 pulsates with strong geometries and patterns of vibrant colour and is populated by a cast of her cross-cultural and trans-historical female personages. In an essay on Spiro and Twombly, Benjamin Booklow argues that both artists present a counter-narrative to the logic of late modernism, from positions that reinvested painting, quotes, with a reconsideration of painting's profound entanglement, not just with myth, but with historical and cultural memory. Her totem, one that's in the other room, exhibited here, references the Celtic fertility figure Sheila Nagig. Her name derived from the Irish meaning Sheila of the breasts. Varying its shape and size, she tends to conform to the model of a scrawny body with non-existent or tiny breasts, but hugely exaggerated vulvas, a contradictory Celtic trinity of maiden, mother, whore. She became something of a feminist icon, expressing the power of female sexuality and sharing an iconography with the Indian death goddess Kali, another reference for Spiro. In Spiro's repetitive figuring of Sheila Nagig throughout her scrolls and installations, the carnivalesque surfaces as an offence against the patriarchy, a Dionysian disturbance of social and sexual taboos that confront the viewer with the undeniable evidence of an actively sexual female body. This body is a site for inscription, symbolically invested and semiotically rich in reference. Each female figure from her lexicon of images invites the viewer to trace a lineage of resistance across myth and history, visual narratives of connection and juxtaposition arranged in rhythmic patterns of movement and repose across her scrolls and installations. In Mignon Nixon's words, Spiro reveals the past that haunts the present through myth, finding in the remains of ancient civilizations cultural encryptions of the passions that haunt the modern world a statement that is actually equally applicable to the Angola. A recourse to the figures of mythology for subject matter to reconnect with contemporary embodied subjects is then common to both artists. Both scavenge historical and literary cultural sources, visual and textual, to assemble their respective aesthetic languages. For Spiro, this was always a project of reclaiming and reawakening a real or mythological antecedent the hidden and silenced female subject, a process frequently necessitating a lengthy period of research and investigation in order to arrive at her epic revisionist narratives, restoring a lost female heritage. At times, this becomes a scholarly pursuit, invited in 1975 to be on a panel of women discussing historical examples of female artists. She spent hours in the library of the Metropolitan Museum researching the medieval nun, Ende, who illuminated the Spanish manuscript of the Apocalypse. Julia Kristeva has distinguished between historical time, the periods of political movements and social change, and monumental time, the capacity for mothering that delineates the female body's temporalities. Women's time describes the cyclical rhythms of the body, evidence in resurrection myths and the cults of eternity that frequent most cultural traditions. Actually, there's another time that one could add to that, which is Nancy time. I mean, anybody who actually knew the artists or uh, went to visit the artists had to actually accept that you waited for Nancy. Sometimes it would be half an hour, sometimes it would be an hour, sometimes it would be as much as two hours. But as somebody said, uh, you always wait for Nancy, and Nancy was always worth waiting for. Like many women of the generation, Spiro read Eric Newman's mythological study, The Great Mother, tracing the archetypal feminine, but seeking her origins in a matriarchal prehistory. However, Spiro always accompanied her fictive characters with historical images of suffering and empowerment. 
Her position of being doubly excluded, both woman and Jew, and her personal experience of the body in pain. I mean, that's the other thing that one has to understand about Nancy, though it's very hard to actually write about without becoming too sort of psychobiographical. That from her mid 30s, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which was progressive uh, and created, I mean, a, a half a lifetime of living with pain and with drugs. So, again, um, she was unable physically to actually work with the materials herself, which is why she needed assistance. Her hands were very badly bent back, so she couldn't actually hold the scissors or the brush by the time she got to about sort of 50 years of age. So, yeah, position of being doubly excluded, both woman and Jew, the personal experience of the body of pain partly accounts for her interest in Judeo-Christian scripture, particularly the word as signifier of both presence, the utterance, and absence, what cannot be spoken. A dialogue between body and voice, flesh and word. Um, again, I was struck when the Matisse exhibition, I think it's actually still on, I'm sure most of you have been to see it, I don't know if you watched the film of Matisse, where he was in the armchair and he was cutting the, uh, you know, the, the, the images uh, out of the paper and then directing the assistant to place them on the wall. Uh, for me, again, it was a very resonant image because I remember when Nancy had uh, an exhibition at, in fact, the Drawing Centre in New York, she had just come out of hospital and she was in a wheelchair, was being wheeled around directing assistants to place her images upon the wall. I also felt there, there were a lot of correspondences, particularly the use of colour and space, both in Matisse, which I think Spiro must have thought about and looked at quite closely. The body that inhabits Gollop's late drawings is Rabelaisian, a body of hybridity and transgression, celebrating life's erotic charge, whilst recognising this is Gollop's late style, after all, the body's mortality. Adroitly counterposing the comedic and the tragic, abstraction and figuration, image and text, Gollum's drawings conjure up satyrs and centaurs, villains and victims, harlots and rogues, nymphs and beasts, all charged with an erotic intensity conveyed through the drawn line and the accidental effects of the old transfer method. Reminiscent of Picasso's end-of-life variations on the artist and model, Images of unfulfilled and hopeless longing, his suite of etchings based upon Ang's take on Raphael's lap for an ara. Gollop gives us no visions of passive and voluptuous femininity, but of bacchanalian excess, an in your face sexuality that is both inviting and taunting, but always in control. Even at the end, the male artist was learning from and responding to the work of his partner, Nancy Spiro. Thank you.